Hello folks and welcome back. Um, in this lecture we'll be covering chapter 3 which is team communication and difficult conversations. And to kind of get the ball rolling I wanted you to watch a little clip from the office uh, that demonstrates a uh, pretty funny but uh, <laughs> nevertheless useful uh, example of a difficult conversation in the workplace. Uh, so if you haven't seen that already uh, pause the video, uh, go over there look at that uh, that link and come back and then we'll get into this chapter about team communication and difficult conversations. All right, and here we can see the learning objectives for today. We've got uh, explaining the principles of team communication in a high performing team, which is I think where we would all like to be when we're doing teamwork. And we'll also describe and demonstrate approaches to planning, running and following up on meetings, explain the principles of effective virtual team communication and describe strategies for effective group writing. Uh, we'll wrap up by explaining basic principles for handling difficult conversations. So I'm pretty sure that um, that clip we've watched from the office gets at all of these. And so we'll try to have some fun with these as well. And here's our chapter overview. So you can see we'll start there with those uh, principles of team communication, go into effective meetings, virtual uh, teams, group writing, and these uh, wrap up with the difficult conversations. All right, so the most common functions of teams in the book uh, makes a pretty good case. And I know it's definitely true <clears throat> that just about, I forget the, the exact statistic, but uh, a large percentage of most jobs, especially jobs in an office, but pretty much any job, any uh, career will have an extensive amount of teamwork. Uh, you'll seldom, unless you're just total independent freelancer, uh, most of the time you'll be working with uh, at least one other person, if not a small group, a committee. Uh, you know, for example, as a professor, we have uh, uh, committees at the departmental or, or even uh, below that we have a caucus, then we have a department, uh, then we have departmental committees, and then uh, there's a, uh, the college level uh, committees at the college level, like the major unit curriculum committee, which I'm on. Uh, which involves uh, professors from a lot of different liberal arts um, majors, let's say. And then beyond that, there's a university level and, and on up. So there's all kinds of teams. Um, and again, uh, it can be difficult. You know, it's definitely not true, and I think you would agree with this, that um, two heads are better than one. <laughs> a lot of the times it would be much more efficient if just one person was uh, doing everything, calling all the shots, not having to... Uh, negotiate all the time, uh, but nevertheless, it's just a fact of uh, modern careers. So we need to try to learn how to do it better. Uh, anyway, here's a list of some common functions of teams uh, with handling a special project. Yes, this comes up all the time. Uh, there's lots of committees that can form rapidly. Say, uh, and, you know, a, ver a new version of D2L is going to roll out. Uh, they know that's going to cause some uh, some friction, right? Some people have to relearn. Uh, stuff will shift around. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that can come up. Uh, even something like uh, when they're changing. I was on a committee one time, and the, the special project was they were changing out the security locks on some of the doors. Uh, so instead of having a, a swipe card system, uh, they would have a, a chip card system. <laughs> something along those lines. <laughs> and they had to have a, uh, you know, they wanted to put together a committee to sort of explore uh, the you know, likely problems and how to get the training out and how to make sure that the uh, security was going to be uh, sufficient and, and all this stuff. So you never know what might come up. Uh, you might be on these teams. Uh, completing the work of particular departments, you know, this is pretty common. Uh, as a member of the English department, there's always some assessment project going on um, and they, they need to get done by a deadline. Uh, developing internal systems innovations, uh, creative customer, creating customer service innovations. And I guess we don't really, we probably wouldn't think about it as customer service <laughs> as, a, as a, being a professor of students, but we do have um, uh, like a, the, the student success collaborative, or student success uh, collaborative uh, initiative. What do they call that? Student success collaborative or collaboration. I forget what the what the exact acronym is for that, but but it's concerned with. Uh, keeping uh, basically helping advisors do a better job uh, so that the advisors can see where not just how you're doing in one class but how you're doing across uh, you know your whole spectrum of classes 
in trying to get uh, the intervention they help in uh, in a more timely fashion. So I put that there. And there's committees that are dedicated to that at the college and university levels. Uh, product innovations, uh, that kind of speaks for itself. Uh, engaging in employee development, this is uh, another factor. You might work in an office where there's uh, what they call retreats. And we'll, and there's lots of examples of this in the office where they're going out and doing special training, uh, learning new skills and, and things of that sort. Uh, reducing the time to market for products and services. Uh, so a lot of these uh, companies uh, will bring in outside experts to come in, consultants to see if they can do this. So they might actually uh, send people around. I think there was an example uh, in the book about the Saturn plant. <laughs> I'm not getting that confused with my other class, but uh, they were talking there about how the employees get more. Uh, you know, they're not just clocking in nine to five. They actually have a role in uh, advising, sort of consulting roles. So that was uh, part of that was to see if they could reduce this time to, to market for their cars. All right, so let's talk here about the barriers to team effectiveness. And there's a statistic here that says uh, uh, business professionals cited ineffective communication 66% as the biggest barrier to team effectiveness. So 66% 60, 60, of these uh, business professionals, professionals said that the biggest problem was ineffective communication. The, the group's just not communicating. And there's very good evidence for this, <laughs> not just in the office, but one of my favorite shows is uh, called Hell's Kitchen uh, with Gord Chef Gordon Ramsay. And this is something he's is constantly berating uh, people about. The, you got these chefs are supposed to be on teams, but they're not telling, they're not communicating, they're not letting people know what what they're doing at the moment or how long it's going to take. So it usually results in a fiasco. Of course, they they're hamming that up for TV, but I think it gets to the point. You know, if you're not able to communicate or not willing to, uh, this is going to cause uh, not just problems for you, uh, but for the team. And I'm sure you've been on teams like that. Uh, one of the another example from uh, uh, locally at the university this is the rowing team. You know, think about the rowing team and how important communication is to that uh, sport. Uh, if the rowers aren't listening, uh, you know, if there's a lack of uh, direction there, they don't, <laughs> they're unable to stay in sync. Uh, then they're not going to win the race, obviously. Uh, but I would say it's probably true for any sport. Uh, soccer <laughs> comes to mind as well. And really, I think the if you want to be an effective soccer player, uh, first and foremost is being about a, being a great communicator uh, and also your observation skills, but really just being able to communicate uh, your intentions, uh, letting other people know the state of the game at that point, because they can't always everybody can't always see what's going on uh, that's out on the on the field there. Uh, let's see uh, what these uh, going on with these uh, statistics. A lack of effective chartering and goal setting. Uh, that's another one. Lack of clarity and understanding of roles. Yes, this one comes up a lot. If you don't know what you're supposed to be doing or what, what, what exactly is expected of you, uh, this can really, uh, well, I think this one can tie into this, uh, this next item here, low morale, right? So if you don't really know what you're supposed to be doing, how can you do a good job? Your confidence begins to erode. Uh, you lose morale that way. And uh, not, not to mention the low productivity. Uh, maybe you didn't know you were supposed to do something. You know, how many times has that happened? You just didn't, weren't, weren't aware of it. Uh, so you don't turn something in, don't submit something. Uh, productivity goes down. And then finally, a lack of trust. And I think we see that uh, all over the office and <laughs> the other areas of life. Right, where if this other stuff starts to break down, pretty soon you just don't trust uh, the, not just the management, but your, your coworkers. Uh, maybe you don't even trust yourself. So th this is all uh, pretty deep stuff. Okay, let's talk now about the frustrating aspects of being part of a team. So again, I turned to the office. Uh, we see plenty of examples of this. I was watching a, just watching a clip, too, from the uh, Big Bang Theory, and they were talking about the, <laughs> the difficulties just of going to a movie. And Sheldon had all these requirements uh, of theaters, and uh, there was only so many movie theaters playing this particular film. <laughs> so it got to be kind of a, 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 a con it was a pretty funny uh, comedy, uh, just how frustrating it was trying to be part of that team to get everybody uh, to agree on something. Uh, but these are just the more general... Uh, uh, aspects you probably run into. 
Uh, first, yeah, I think this is first and foremost, ineffective use of meeting time. Uh, so I, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I get, I'm already kind of uh, frustrated when somebody wants to have a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, on a day I don't normally come to campus when it's super cold. <laughs> it's like 20 below, uh, wind chill 30 below, uh, somebody wants to have a, you know, say an hour long meeting, uh, then my first thought is this meeting had better be useful, All right? There better be some good, you know, damn good reason to have us coming in to meet face to face at such a time, right? I'm sure you probably felt that way as well. Uh, so that's probably one of the biggest ones. You know, am I just wasting my time in this meeting? Does this meeting even apply to me? Uh, that's a big one. That can be really frustrating if you feel like you're just wasting time or even uh, wasting the company's time. Now, a lot of times I'm sitting in a meeting thinking, you know, I could be at home putting together a lecture right now. I could be grading papers right now. <laughs> all, this, all this stuff is not necessarily more fun, but just more useful than that meeting. Just, sometimes the meetings just feel like it's there. You're there to gratify somebody's ego, uh, to justify some somebody's paycheck. <laughs> That's probably bigger than yours. Well, let's see, ineffective, ineffective communication among the team members. Yes, yeah, another big one. Uh, some people just aren't, you know, we talked about this before. Somebody's really introverted. They might not be comfortable uh, talking to you about something. Or they might be the opposite, right? Just constantly talking. Uh, this happens to me more often than not. I've got a point I need to make to the team, and this <laughs> this one person just will not be quiet even for a second. Uh, they're not listening to what anybody else is saying. It's just blah, 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 blah. Can't communicate. Uh, lack of accountability. Yes, this is a, <laughs> you know, this is a, I hear this from students all the time that are doing group student work, and they'll say, well, you know, I felt like I did all the work on this. This other student didn't turn in anything, and I don't like the idea of them not being held accountable for that. You know, they didn't make the meetings, they didn't submit any work, or they submitted bad work. Uh, I don't feel like they should get the same grade, <laughs> the same number of points as, you know, me, uh, the other people on the team that did do the work. And so that can be frustrating. Now, let's see, individuals who don't complete assignments, well, that ties into to that one, obviously. Uh, let's see, lack of preparation in meetings, uh, another uh, problem, you know, and I'm, I've chaired plenty of committees where you're, you know, it's kind of this balance you have to strike because you can't expect sometimes uh, people who are already busy to spend like two or three hours preparing for a meeting. It's just not, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Uh, but it can nevertheless get frustrating when you, you kind of have to keep going over basic stuff uh, that people, you know, maybe somebody could have already looked at the agenda, let's say, so that when they get there, they can just quickly approve it instead of having to sit there and read it for 10 minutes. Uh, so all sorts of things like this uh, can lead to problems or lead to frustrations. All right, so let's, uh, those are the barriers, the frustrations. Uh, let's take a, let's kind of flip the table here. Look at the what the effective team communicators can do. And I think this is really where the big value comes in because we've all, we've all been on bad teams. We've, we've all been frustrated. You know, that's nothing new. Uh, but what about the teams uh, that really uh, operate smoothly, uh, that really get the job done? And I hope you've had the pleasure of being on some of those teams. I know I have, and it's basically night and day. You know, you get on an effective team and you feel like you can just conquer the world. Uh, so let's look at some of their... Uh, some of the principles that will help you and your team to get there. Uh, so the team should focus first and foremost on performance, right? So everybody has to be focused on this. They have to basically buy in uh, to what that team is about. Uh, so if everybody on the team is uh, focused on this, this everything else will basically take care of itself. Um, you know, think about other teams where they, you know, if it's a student project and everybody is really dedicated to making, uh, not just making a, an A on the project, but they really just want to do, they really want to hand in a, a great project. You know, if you, have you been on a team like that? You know, it's, it's almost contagious uh, that this uh, enthusiasm that can come from that. Uh, the four natural stages to reach the performance. So it's not like you jump on this team on day one and you're instantly outputting a, a high performance. We'll talk about these uh, stages you need to go through and about how long it takes uh, each stage to get to that level. Uh, the effective teams build a work culture around values, norms, and goals. And this is where I think a lot of teams break down. You know, if they don't share values, 
they don't have as maybe one person says you know i'd be okay with a c for this project or <laughs> my goal is you know this is not a uh this is not this class is not part of my major i don't really care about uh, you know as long as i make a c i'm okay uh, i want to do the <laughs> minimal amount of work on it <laughs> you know so imagine you got like somebody that like that on the team and that's going to create a lot of conflict uh, whereas this more effective team would do whatever they could possibly do to get everybody to share the values and the goals and you know the norms as well like what's considered um you know what what's everybody's idea of what is considered okay <laughs> uh, versus slacking let's say uh, and then they, just finally the effective teams meet more often you know it's hard to have an effective team if you let so much time go by between meetings uh, you probably might even forget people's names right I've been on teams where I did, you know <laughs> you don't even know half the people you never really get to know them uh, just because there's not enough uh, meetings all right so let's look at some more of these principles and you could be asking yourself when thinking about the uh, the clip from the office or other uh, shows you've seen other episodes or maybe experiences you've had in, in teams uh, which <laughs> which of these line up and which didn't and what made your team less effective or by contrast what made that team more effective uh, so let's think about this first one here embracing differing viewpoints and conflict all right so that sounds easy it's easy to say this right well you should embrace differing viewpoints and conflict <laughs> but how often is this the reality <laughs> you know most of the time you, you don't really want to disagree with somebody you don't want to create conflict at least that's me uh, other people seem to thrive on it uh, but you can sort of see how yes it would be nice if we could even though i'm kind of committed to this one viewpoint uh, maybe I should open my mind a little bit, be a little bit more flexible, try to see uh, this other person's viewpoint. And if everybody on the team does that, well, you can see how that would lead to <laughs> be a lot more effective. Uh, let's see. Uh, effective teams provide a lot of positive feedback and evaluate their performance often. So a couple of key points here. The, the positive feedback, I think, is, uh, is critical. Uh, some people get in the habit and you have probably work with somebody like this or maybe you're, you're like this yourself you only comment about something if it's negative uh, you know so I, I feel bad for servers and restaurants because uh, it seems like the only time somebody wants to fill out one of those comment cards or, or leave a review is if they've had a bad experience and they want to sort of broadcast that almost to kind of get revenge or to punish the person it's not very effective and you can imagine somebody on the team that was just always putting everybody else down all the time. They're, they're quick to point out flaws, uh, but they never mention, or uh, they ne they don't feel any need to mention when somebody's doing a good job or, or complimenting them on something. So uh, that's key. And I always say before you give any negative feedback, you should try to give at least twice as much positive feedback before that. Uh, otherwise, that person will just shut off. They might even get uh, emotionally hijacked. Uh, which we talked about last time uh, this next point is important too evaluating their performance often so you always want to be asking yourself is the team working well are we making good progress towards our goals you, know, you can uh, uh, write progress reports even uh, but you don't again don't want to let too much time go by without evaluating that team's performance and, you know those of you who have been on teams uh, sports i mean all this stuff i'm sure <laughs> kind of old hat for you and you know uh, firsthand what when it works and when it doesn't that's the effective teams feel uh, feel a common sense of purpose and this kind of comes back again to those shared values and goals right is everybody working towards that same uh, they have that feeling of belonging and part of that feeling of belonging comes from having uh, the shared purpose so <laughs> what is the purpose uh, sometimes you, sometimes i've been on groups i'm not even really sure what the purpose of that group is right and that's uh, that's pretty that's about as damaging as you can be starting out uh, you need to have this a clear sense of purpose okay so we, we talked about these four stages or we're about to talk about them i should say uh, so here they are we have a nice uh, image here to sort of show us about how uh, long let's see team performance level high uh, medium and low over on the left and then the months together as a team and the best case scenario along the bottom of this uh, that's what this uh, uh, horizontal axis is showing uh, so the forming you can see there takes about a month this is a seven month uh, spectrum here so it takes about a month to form 
Now then we'll go on to storming, which we'll talk about what that is. You can see that's a little bit longer than the forming. Uh, the norming takes the biggest chunk. So look how long that takes to kind of get to that uh, normal, uh, <laughs> normal operations. And then finally, look, just the tip. There's just another month of performance. So you don't even get as much, you don't spend as much time in this performing uh, bracket as you did with, even with the forming of the group. Uh, so you can see how too, spending too much time or not enough time on any of these uh, other ones would uh, have an even worse impact here. Really, it'd be nice to get this <laughs> performing thing stretched out as much as possible. Now, anyway, let's take each one of these uh, stages in turn. So you got the forming stage. So that's when this, as you can expect from the name forming, <laughs> they're focusing on uh, gaining acceptance and avoiding conflict, basically getting to know each other. Uh, the storming stage is when they open up with competing ideas about how the team should approach the work. So, you know, think about any kind of project, group project you've been on. It's at St. Cloud or maybe even in high school or whatever it is. You, you know that there's these two stages. And this uh, storming stage is really critical because that's where you're making sort of the big decisions. Uh, norming stage, you're arriving at the plan. So you kind of got most, most of the basics uh, figured out at this point. You're thinking about the roles, goals, accountabilities, it's all the norming stage. And then this performing stage obviously is where you're, you've, you've, everything else has come together, you're finally operating efficiently. Uh, so let's uh, see what we have here. Uh, team culture uh, refers to the set of shared perceptions and commitment to collective values, norms, roles, responsibilities and goals. This is all part of what they're calling a team culture. And I can see this, you know, when a group tends to break down, uh, it can sometimes be over, it could be over any one of these. Uh, you know, like the collective values, you know, most uh, professors have a fairly good sense of their, you know, why they think their work is important or why they think their, uh, whatever their classes are important or their, uh, their subject matter. You know, critical thinking. Let's say we we have a, we all share a commitment to uh, teaching students to be good critical thinkers. You know, we sort of all agree on that. Uh, but other things you might be a little more conflicted on. Uh, like I noticed, some some professors would be a little more skeptical about. Well, that should that include looking at popular culture? You know, maybe the <laughs> we shouldn't. Uh, maybe they have a different value when it comes to what what is what actually counts as uh, literature. You know, so there could be some uh, disagreement around that, or there could be a, a shared collective value, and we just have to find where that common ground is. Uh, the norms, uh, roles, you know, roles is another big one. You know, what is my role on this committee? <laughs> what are my responsibilities? Am I supposed to be uh, providing feedback? If so, how do I know if somebody's listening to the feedback? How do I know they're going to uh, take it seriously? Yeah, and do we all have the same goals? You know, this is a big one that comes up and just in my life being a professor, because you see professors, some professors have very different goals. Uh, like some, uh, one of the goals of some might be to uh, weed out uh, students who aren't serious enough, or who, who, who don't, who they don't think are qualified to do the job, right? So they might see that their their goal is kind of being a gatekeeper or a guardian, uh, versus somebody else who has a completely opposite goal of saying we really just need to bring everybody in, uh, regardless of a skill level, and help them get up to that, uh, you know, up to that level. We're here for everybody, not <laughs> just particularly uh, talented or gifted students, let's say. And so this is all part, and you can see, you know, how this would affect the whole, not just those, those two individuals, but the, basically the culture of the team. You know, this, these balances that are eventually struck between these uh, sometimes conflicting uh, com perceptions and commitments. And the team charter, <laughs> this provides direction to the team and how it functions to, to meet the shared objectives. So I've seen these plenty of times. It depends on the type of team, the level of formality. A lot of times I've been brought in to work on these uh, university uh, committees, like there's one called CAT, which is, uh, God, I don't even know what that acronym stands for, <laughs> Teaching Technology Committee on something, Teaching Technology or something like that. Uh, but anyway, it's made up of people, not just professors. Um, professors actually kind of just play in a minor role. It's mostly uh, it, some administrators are on there, some uh, members of the faculty association. 
and then some uh, technicians, the people that will you know, actually be working, programming the software, developing it. Uh, there's vendors in there. And it's just a big, it's a, it's a very diverse team. So they put together this team charter. Uh, it's a very kind of formal way to say, you know, here's what we're doing. Uh, here's, here's the objective of the team. And it gives you something you can refer back to, uh, you know, in these meetings. It, it is kind of a, a useful document sometimes. Uh, if some, it, it completely avoids the problem of not knowing, like, why am I here? What is the purpose of this team? Uh, that's not a problem with a team charter because everything is spelled out uh, pretty exactly. Uh, yeah, so the, the tasks of the committee, how they're going to communicate, uh, when the meetings are going to be, or the meeting protocol, uh, they're going to use Robert's Rules of Order, for example, uh, which would be a very kind of formal meeting, or they'd be more laid back. Uh, you know, how do you make sure that different everybody gets a, a chance to speak their opinion? How do decisions get made, conflicts resolved, uh, feedback mechanisms? So again, depend, you wouldn't do this for an ad hoc quick team. Uh, but if it's something that's going to last a while or be a permanent team, I think it's, you could see how it'd be well worthwhile to uh, spell all that out and agree on it at the, at the beginning. You know, what do we have here? Yes, here's an example of a team charter. Yeah, so we can see there's the, the mission statements, uh, the values, <laughs> excellence in all work, <laughs> uh, creativity, honesty, sharing and collaboration, professional growth. So uh, I think those are pretty ge pretty general generic values. See goals, uh, those are more specific. So to become the premier resort destination for sustainable conferences in this region, uh, to increase revenue annually by 12%. So I, I kind of like the goals that are a little bit more specific because you can see, well, I've, you know, you either make, you either increase revenue annually by 12% or you don't, <laughs> you know, so that's a goal where you know you, whether you can satisfy, whether you've uh, satisfied that or not. And you can see how far it is to get there. Uh, I like that kind of goal better than just something real broad and general. Uh, you can see there the team members, positions, responsibilities, how they'll be communicating. Uh, when they'll have their meetings, where, and stuff in there about note takers. Uh, decision making, we aim for consensus. If Basically, everybody can agree. If we don't achieve it, though, decisions will be based on a majority vote of the general manager, director of marketing, and, and conventions. So even in a small group, you know, this can come up. If you got a group member that just insists on one thing, and there's uh, the other two can't come around, you know, what do you do? just majority rules <laughs> or do you have some uh, better ideas maybe go to and let a third party settle it you know some people do that uh, arbitration uh, and the feedback so a lot of people just get up and leave the meeting it's not really very useful it's better if they can provide some feedback you know talk about the team talk about the meeting you know, how did this meeting go you know, what's the takeaways here and they really, they, I like this because they kind of come back in this feedback section back to their uh, goals, looks like. Uh, so each one of these goes back. Even like here, the, uh, the reaching the professional goals and professional growth was part was one of their key values they identified there. So it's nice that they come back to it here. But anyway, that's, this is a pretty good example of a team charter. Uh, the one that I'm on with CATS, a lot longer than this, a lot more detailed, but it's basically the same thing. All right, and on to uh, diversity, or why it's important to embrace uh, different viewpoints. And a lot of people get the wrong idea about diversity, and they think it's just kind of a, either just a political thing, or they think it's kind of a, uh, unrealistic, uh, or sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, sort of utopian ideals or something. Uh, it's really nothing like that. It's just, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, basically it's just a matter of uh, making more profit in a lot of cases. Uh, they, studies, a lot of studies show if you have good diversity, uh, if people are embracing it, you just make a lot more money because everything works better. You get all these different ideas coming in. Let's see, I have a, a statistic here. Uh, companies with 2D diversity are about 45% more likely to report a growth in market share during the past year and about 70% more likely to have captured a new market. So just think about that from a business point of view. Uh, you know, 45% more likely to have growth, 70% uh, more likely to capture a totally new market. And if you wrap your head around that, you can see why everybody's uh, excited about this. <laughs> this concept, they're promoting it, encouraging it, you know, at every level uh, to try to get you um, 
more comfortable with diversity. Uh, but let's look at a couple different kinds. Uh, talk here about, and this is what most people think about as uh, when they hear the word diversity, they think about inherent diversity. Uh, so examples of this might be, uh, they start with age. Uh, so you might have a team with people that are in their 60s, some are maybe in their 20s, 30s. You, know, you can have a broad diversity that way. Uh, gender is another one. You probably wouldn't want to be, uh, you know, just with uh, a team with all men or all women. You know, it's better to have diversity. Uh, you know, again, for those multiple viewpoints. Uh, ethnicity and sexual orientation. So this is what usually people think about as the inherent diversity. Uh, but there's also this other one. This is really key. I think this one tends to get overlooked, you know, for the sake of that former category. But this is the acquired diversity. Uh, so something that, uh, the, let me just start with the examples here. Uh, so experience, basically. So you might have somebody on your team uh, with extensive customer service experience. Uh, somebody else might have a lot of retail experience or uh, engineering experience. Uh, the committee I'm on, I was talking about earlier with the CAT, uh, they have professors on there who, of course, have a lot of experience using the technologies <laughs> to teach with. <laughs> They're the teachers, right? Uh, but that's a different, whole different uh, experience than the person that's got uh, than somebody from the technical support team who's got a lot of experience uh, installing the software, troubleshooting it, uh, tutoring people that need help with the software. And it's a different set of experience. And then also the people that have, uh, you know, think about the other folks who might have a lot of retail experience. And so they've sold a lot of these products or maybe they're the salesperson, sales rep there. And so they know a lot about the uh, how different schools uh, which schools have purchased this, what their experience has been like. So they have yet another uh, perspective. It doesn't really take a lot of thought to consider how uh, the more diversity you have in both these areas, uh, the more uh, viewpoints you'll get. And some of it will be useful, some won't. Uh, but <laughs> you know, it's never, I don't know if you can ever get to a point where you have uh, too much information. Uh, it's better, the more information you have, the more sound of a decision you can make. All right, some behaviors that drive diversity. Because just, just having, you know, as you can see, <laughs> episodes of The Office, there's kind of an infamous, infamous sketch there where they had a diversity episode. And maybe I'll show you that at, at some point. Um, now just having a diverse team doesn't really help. Uh, it only, it's only helpful if you have the behaviors that drive, uh, that drive it. So it's not, again, not just enough to have, you know, this sort of a smorgasbord. Uh, of team members. Uh, you also need to have uh, good behaviors, good modeling uh, to go along with that to make it effective. And this is the first point is probably the most critical, making sure everyone is heard. You know, making sure everyone is heard. Uh, we talked about introverted and extroverted last time. We talked about those, uh, the blues, the greens, the reds, the hubs. Uh, so this can be the real uh, bugbear here. If you got somebody who's really extroverted or a couple of people who are really extroverted, they're just talking, they're dominating the, the conversation, uh, the other folks can't get a word in. You know, that, that can be a real, uh, a real obstacle, uh, especially if you know it's somebody that might already be uh, a little sensitive, a little insecure. Like I was talking about a team, uh, one of these committees where the, some of the people on the committee were... Uh, uh, they were from a different union, right? They're, they're sort of considered staff uh, instead of faculty. And they felt uh, intimidated because the other folks on the committee were faculty. They had a lot more power and uh, <laughs> they had a little bit uh, more trouble making themselves uh, heard. Maybe they didn't talk the lingo, uh, same, basically the same language. And so it's even more important there to really make sure, hey, we want to just make double sure we give these folks time uh, to listen to what they have to say. Uh, so then, anyway, this first one can be a big problem. Let's see, number two, making it safe to let team members express novel ideas. Uh, so you can think about the uh, those groups you've been on where it's, everybody's just always agreeing. Uh, they're more worried about achieving a quick consensus. Uh, they don't want to rock the boat, uh, all that sort of thing, instead of uh, just saying, look, I have an idea. <laughs> It's something uh, kind of uh, from left field, but let's consider this sort of radical idea. You know, I've even been on uh, 
I've recently been playing a lot of uh, role-playing uh, Dungeons and <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons uh, games, and you'd be surprised how all this stuff applies even to a game like that. And we saw the example of the uh, in the clip of uh, the Call of Duty sessions. Yeah, but what if somebody does have a sort of wacky idea? It sounds kind of crazy. You know, should you just if you uh, say, well, that's a stupid idea, you know, or you, or you just ignore it, uh, that can just kind of silence them. Uh, they won't feel comfortable in the future expressing those ideas. And for, and for all you know, that might have been the <laughs> the idea of the century, <laughs> uh, but you just quickly dismissed it. And imagine how silly uh, you'd you'd be, you'd feel about this. And I got countless examples uh, from my work with the game, video game history of these uh, teams where they weren't, weren't listening to somebody. Uh, like Activision, the company Activision was founded uh, because the, uh, the, the key members of the video game development team, people that were making Atari's best-selling games, uh, they felt like they couldn't say anything. They couldn't challenge the, uh, the leadership. And so they ended up leaving the company to found their own company, <laughs> Activision. <laughs> uh, so that could all have been avoided if they had just felt safer, uh, you know, expressing their ideas and making sure they're, and, and if they felt like they were heard and respected, they probably would have stayed there. But especially this third one, I think, uh, giving the team members decision-making authority. I said people feel a lot more uh, like they're part of a team if they have some kind of authority to make decisions. It's always a little shame, I think, when you're on a committee and there's, uh, you know, let's say, well, so-and-so has decision-making authority, but these other folks are there just kind of in an advisory role or consulting role. And it feels, I kind of feel like, you know, I sort of get it, uh, but at the same time, obviously they're not going to be nearly as invested because they're responsible. Not only do they not share that responsibility, but they might feel like, well, why? It's just pointless. You know, I'm not the one that's going to be making the decision here. Uh, shouldn't I have a, some role to play? Uh, even in classes, you know, my colleague and uh, Sharon Cogdell and I, we're kind of big on this. Like it shouldn't just be just the professor telling you, make you know, calling all the shots all the time, and saying, you know, this is what you're going to write your paper about. <laughs> you know, why can't you say just let them, you know, let the students propose a topic. Maybe I'll uh, reserve the right to, you know, ultimately say that's fine or choose another topic. But uh, just letting you decide uh, what you want to write about uh, can go a long way towards uh, driving the diversity, right? I mean, imagine if I just said everybody's going to write about certain topic. Well, that's what I'm going to get. I'm not going to get a diversity of uh, essays or projects. I'm just going to get everybody turning in basically the same uh, the same thing. Of course, uh, I leave it open to you. Uh, chances are there will be some that are you know pretty far out, but maybe also brilliant. Well, let's see what moving on here. Sharing the credit. <laughs> you know, this is another big one. You notice uh, really effective politicians, they always start their speeches by thanking people. You know, the first thing out of their mouth will be, first of all, you know, I want to say a special thanks or special shout out to so-and-so for hosting the meeting and so-and-so for this and so-and-so for that. Sometimes they go on for, you know, 10 minutes just thanking people, sharing all this credit. And that's really uh, key because uh, people like that. They like, you know, if you feel like your work is valued, your productivity is going to shoot up astronomically. Uh, whereas if you feel like somebody's taking credit for you, credit for your work, you know, they're getting... Uh, the credit for what you did, uh, then you get really angry, upset, frustrated. <laughs> Productivity is probably going to go pew. <laughs> uh, let's see, giving useful feedback. Uh, so some of you work in the writing center, uh, the right place, and you know the difference. Or you might have gotten feedback on papers or pe feedback from peer reviews. Some of it can be really useful. Uh, sometimes it just hurts your feelings, or it's you can tell the person didn't even really uh, look at it. <laughs> <laughs> they were too. Maybe people are too afraid of hurting your feelings to really tell you what you need to hear. Uh, so that works both ways. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see that would uh, how that would drive diversity. If I say that I want to have uh, a member of the software team on the committee, uh, then I need to make sure that they are in a position uh, where they can give me feedback uh, from their point of view about how I'm using the product. I don't want to just keep saying, "Well, this is how I'm going to use it." I don't <laughs> care what you have to say. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, putting feedback into action. Yes, is another another key. This is one that burns me more often uh, than not. I've uh, you know I've, I, I'm, I, many times, especially when I was new, you know, I'd get emails from people and they'd 
or, uh, <laughs> different decision makers, and they would say things like, "We're, you know, we want you to give some feedback on this." Uh, the first, the first big project I worked on here was uh, the computer lab in 221, and they were saying they wanted it wasn't in 221 then, but uh, never mind. Uh, saying we're putting this computer lab together, we, we want feedback on it, and they had all these questions they wanted everybody to answer. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of work on it. Some colleagues did a lot of work on it. Uh, but ultimately, basically, none of the feedback, <coughs> nothing we said got implemented. And I just felt like, you know, they had a plan for this all along. And they pretended to want feedback. You know, they put out feelers that basically just kind of give the impression that they were, this was going to be a group making <laughs> decision <laughs> when really everything was ignored. Uh, so that was extremely frustrating. It just kind of made me feel like, well, next time they do this, I'm just going to say, you know, guys, whatever it is, you know what you want to do. Just, yeah, that's great. <laughs> you know, I felt like they just wanted me to say, yeah, that's great. You kind of rubber stamp it, give my approval, not actually get the feedback. Uh, so you can see there, I gave you a lot of my personal examples, but I'm sure you have plenty of uh, your own uh, on each one of these. All right, so a little bit more about the embracement, <laughs> embracement, embrace, embracing of different viewpoints. Uh, so the disassociation and association. Uh, so let's talk about dissociation first. So this is where the professionals accept critique of their ideas without taking it personally and becoming offensive. So you're able to disassociate yourself uh, from this. And this, I noticed in some of the comments from on the earlier lectures, people were saying this is something they struggle with. You know, you get a, you know, as a writer, uh, I get sometimes very nasty uh, reviews of uh, books I've written uh, or uh, academics will do when during the peer review process. Sometimes people just seem like they're uh, really being rude and, and obnoxious. <laughs> so, I mean, at least that's how it feels. And it can really just, you talk about emotional hijacking. I mean, it can really get your hackles up and you feel like, you know, I would like to just, you know, <laughs> I slap this person. I mean, they're just way out of line. They, you know, they're talking about me, right? They're really just insulting me. They're insulting my honor. <laughs> Sir, I challenge you to a duel. <laughs> you kind of get to that level of anger and uh, that level of defensiveness sometimes uh, when really... You know, if you could just uh, dissociate, disassociate yourself a little bit, you could see, well, they're not talking about me personally. Uh, they're talking about uh, my work. And if I can just disassociate myself enough to where I can take in that feedback, maybe even consider what they're saying. Who knows? Maybe they have some good ideas. You know, and usually what happens is you, you eventually you cool off and you realize, well, they, they probably were making some good points and I probably should. Uh, you know, take that seriously. I mean, one of the ways I've sort of strategized myself personally to do this is just, no matter what it is, to always start off by thanking you. Well, thank you for that uh, criticism. I, you know, it couldn't have been easy to be that <laughs> blunt <laughs> or that honest. You know, I appreciate the honesty. You know, I kind of start from that position and then try to, uh, you know, try not to take things personally. But, you know, I don't think anybody's invulnerable to this, honestly. You can't always uh, dissociate. Maybe sometimes you should. Uh, and then the, associ uh, the association is that bond that occurs between people <laughs> and their ideas. <laughs> uh, so let's look at here what we have the uh, the chart. So the disassociation, association, they got that going around. The, the borders there at the start of meeting or team communication, the end of the meeting or team communication. Uh, so yeah, this makes sense. So when the, your, your team is just starting to form, you got lots of ideas flying around, uh, lots of, uh, you might say, well, why don't we do this? You know, and somebody says, no, I don't like that. Why don't we do this other thing? And the key is if everybody can kind of keep loose, keep uh, flexible, keep versatile, not get too uh, defensive or attached to any particular thing, you know, don't, <laughs> you know, don't let the cement uh, solidify until you get to this last stage of association. You know, this is where it's key to, yeah, okay, I didn't get my way. <laughs> <laughs> or not, everybody didn't agree 100% on everything, or some of my ideas got shot down. But, you know, can you get beyond that uh, to bond uh, with whatever was settled on? And if you can't, it's not going to go well for the team. It's better if you can find a way to bond with that.
Okay, developing quick trust and working in short-term teams. So say a group project in the class. Maybe it only lasts a class period. Uh, maybe it lasts a semester. Or these committees I'm on, some are semester long, some are permanent. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking here at maybe a team that would just be a few months or even a, a few weeks. Let's just say <laughs> something that's not going to last a year. So less than a, a year. Uh, so what are some just quick ways to jump in there? Uh, first, obviously, <laughs> getting to know each other. So you probably had lots of classes where they start off with that ter terrifyingly uh, awkward. <laughs> Let's go around the room and everybody tell us who you are and why you're here and why you think you're so smart. <laughs> so, kind of exaggerate, exaggerating that a little bit, but, uh, you know, it can be really hard to break that ice. Uh, so there's better ways to do it than that, I think. But, yeah, trying to get to know each other will really help. You get to feel start start to feel that bonding after a while. Yeah, the effective launch meeting. That's the uh, you don't want, necessarily want to just jump into business right away. Um, let's see what else we have here. Commit to working together and separately. Yeah, this is another key. So you don't want somebody to feel like the only time they need to do anything is when their the whole group is together. You know, it's not very effective. You want people to be able to do stuff at home, uh, but yet not have this so separated that it's a mess when you, you finally do come back together. Uh, or I think about this too with, in terms of uh, sports teams. Uh, so you don't want somebody, you know, whatever team you're on, the expectation is usually that, yeah, you're going to be doing some practicing it by yourself. You're going to be working out at home or reading up on the topic or watching videos. You know, everything doesn't have to be done uh, when everybody's together, uh, but you want to commit to that. So you'll be working together well <laughs> and, and you'll do stuff at home. Uh, set up a deliverable schedule and evaluate performance regularly. So they gave some really solid advice in the book. You know, even with the projects at school, uh, if you know, if you know, the deadline for this collaborative project is the end of February, then you don't want to wait till the end of February to uh, produce anything or have anything ready for submission. Uh, the, it's a much better plan to say, okay, you, uh, you know, this person will have his part done on end of January, this person will have uh, her part done by the 1st of February, whatever. And so you have this schedule, and that gives you time to evaluate it. And so you can see, well, this, okay, we can see where this this part here is about 70% where it needs to be. <laughs> you have some time to do some more work uh, versus if everybody just turns it in all at the end, well, then you're screwed if uh, somebody dropped the ball. Uh, some behavior that drives trust in teams. So we want to trust each other. You know a team doesn't work well if you don't. So what can you do to uh, inspire people to trust you? And first is the, the self-disclosure. So this is just sharing information about yourself. What are your goals? What are your aspirations? <laughs> what are your views? Uh, what kind of experiences have you, have you had in the past? You know, this is kind of getting to know somebody. Uh, of course, I think some of the stuff you might share might make you look you know, might might uh, might discourage trust if you say, "Oh yes, you know, I've been on many group projects and they've all sucked, and we've always I've always made an F on every one because I didn't do anything. I just preferred to coast." <laughs> uh, I don't know. Would you feel like such a person was more trustworthy? Would you say, "Well, they're honest at least"? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, yeah, with that self-disclosure, though, I can think of some examples where it would matter. You know, somebody says to you, well, you know, here's the thing. I work two, two jobs outside of school and I, you know, I, I work hard, but I might not have as much time as, you know, the other group members do to work on this. I'm just telling you that I'm putting that out there, just being honest. Uh, something like that might might help inspire trust. At least that way, you know, that person isn't just being lazy or negligent. Uh, you know, they got a lot of stuff going on and they're, they're telling you about that up front. Uh, planning for meetings, essential questions. <laughs> so, uh, so here's where I think that clip from the office will come in handy. Uh, so let's think about that little meeting uh, that uh, Jim had with the, I forget the, anyway, that, that manager. Uh, so you could ask these questions. Well, I'll give you a chance. And hopefully I won't forget this time to put the question in. But what is the purpose of the meeting? You know, big question. Why you want me to, to come to campus? at uh, you know, 9 a.m. on a Friday morning when I normally wouldn't be there. I don't have anything else planned for that day. 
Now, what is the purpose of that meeting? You know, it needs to be spelled out. It needs to, and hopefully it's something that uh, will be, seem important to me. Uh, what outcomes do I expect? So what am I going to get out of this meeting? Or not just what I'm going to get out of it, but, you know, whatever. What's the department going to get out of this? Uh, what's the college going to get out of the university? You know, what, what are the outcomes? Uh, who should attend the meeting? So anyway, with this first one, I'll come back to. And this is what a lot of the humor of the office comes back to, right, is, is people feeling like the, the meeting serves no purpose or relevant purpose. <laughs> They're getting nothing out of it. It's just pointless. Uh, who should attend the meeting? Yeah, that's kind of essential. You know, should everybody be there? Is, it, is this a work for a special committee or a subcommittee or the entire committee? Uh, when should the meeting be scheduled? So, I, you know, even professors and that have been, you know, working, doing this work for 30, 40 years, sometimes they'll forget to put critical information like this. So they'll just, they'll just say, you know, we need to meet tomorrow at noon. And they won't put <laughs> where. <laughs> So I put when and where there instead of just when, but I guess that covers it. Uh, what roles and responsibilities should people at the meeting have? This is another big one. Nobody likes going to a meeting and then getting yelled at for being unprepared. Hey, you didn't say. You didn't tell me I needed to have that or come to the meeting with something. Uh, you know, that was vague. I didn't know. And so it wasn't spelled out. So again, we come back to this idea of the essential questions. You know, I just, you know, I know some of you are in graduate school. Hopefully, uh, some of the undergrads are thinking about it as well. But this is the, exactly the same set of questions that comes up uh, with a the thesis defense. And so, one of the big questions the students always have is, well, what, what is my role going to be? You know, am I there kind of defending? What, what do you mean defend the thesis? Are you going, <laughs> are you folks going to be yelling at me, trying to shoot me down, trying to poke holes in my argument? Uh, what are my responsibilities? You know, am I supposed to? Uh, one of the things that comes up oddly enough is uh, whether the uh, the student should bring coffee, <laughs> and orange juice, or snacks uh, to the meeting. I don't know where that er came from. You know, you're not really. That's not a responsibility. Uh, you know that you have, or even like who should attend. You know, some people will say, is it okay if I bring my uh, boyfriend or girlfriend or you know, spouse, uh, can other can friends come? Uh, you know, should the should every should the outside reader be there? <laughs> so all this stuff comes up in, in those meetings. Uh, but you can see, to the extent that you know the answers to these questions, uh, the more comfortable you'll be at that defense. You know, if you know exactly what your role is going to be, what your responsibilities are, uh, all this other stuff. You know, what what is the purpose of the uh, the defense? You know, all this stuff <laughs> will make you a lot more comfortable. To make that. Uh, meaning less, not only less uh, scary, but actually a lot more satisfying. And then some other questions here. Uh, what will be the agenda? So we're still talking, I guess, about the short, short uh, meetings, but or the uh, short-term teams. But yeah, you still want to know what all we're going to cover on that meeting. That's the agenda, the plan for the meeting. Uh, what material should I distribute prior to the meeting? Uh, sometimes this is the agenda itself. So if it's the curriculum committee, for example, I have to go make print. I have to print out the copies and make sure everybody has one. If you know that it's going to be something uh, really extensive, a lot of detail, you might want to print that out too. <clears throat> uh, when and how to invite others. Uh, this can be a big one, uh, you know, especially if you don't know people's <laughs> names, <laughs> uh, much less their email address. Uh, if it's a meeting that needs to happen quickly, maybe email is not the best. You know, maybe this person's gone home for the weekend and somebody that doesn't check email. Uh, so maybe you need a different way to uh, to arrange that or they need more heads up. You know, I hear from people that say, look, I live in the Twin Cities or I live in, you know, 100 miles away from campus. You can't just say, uh, meet me in 10 minutes. You know, I need to have uh, this stuff needs to be planned out, you know, at least a couple days in advance. You know, so all those kind of issues can, can come up. Uh, what logistical issues do I need to take care of? Oh, yes, this is another another big one that gets me all the time. Matter of fact, even as I'm writing this, I'm thinking, you know, I have not reserved the rooms <laughs> for, the, for the caucus meetings this semester, so I need to get on that. That's a logistical issue I need to take care of. Uh, make sure we have a room to meet in. Uh, make, getting equipment, that's usually not an issue for me, but uh, maybe you need a projector. 
uh, printing materials, the uh, same thing. At least productive parts of the workday. This is, uh, I thought this was great. So I never really thought about it before, but what is the best time to have a meeting? And apparently there's been some studies done on this. <laughs> and so now we know, or at least we can uh, hypothesize, right? So look, if you look here, they're saying the best time to have a meeting looks like sometime between nine and noon. Or is that 11? <laughs> anyway, just not too early in the morning. You know, so not before people's coffee is kicked in, uh, but just as that coffee is kicking in, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling good. You've, you're, <laughs> you've, you've woke up, <laughs> you know, about 10 a.m. being the optimal slot uh, for the meeting. And then you can see how after that gets less and less and less productive. You know, probably my guess is around if you have the meeting at noon, like a lot of our meetings are, people are hungry, they're eating, uh, or they're upset because they didn't get to have lunch. You know, that's not a good idea. <clears throat> they had to eat early and their food is digesting. <laughs> Usually not good. <laughs> yeah, same thing here. This is probably digestion, digestion taking place. You know, they've been there all day. They're kind of uh, looking at the clock. And certainly by 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, you know, you just want to get home. If you're there at 6, you're probably even resentful that you're even there. You're like, man, I should be at home. Uh, why am I here? <laughs> oh, God, why am I here? <laughs> Uh, so this is something to really think about. You know, if you have the flexibility to pick a time, you know, I kind of think of it just from my own experience as a teacher. I, when I do have a face-to-face -face class, I always like to have that 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. slot. I just kind of default to that. Uh, and I find that just, you know, what I've been saying, you know, you got that too early. Yeah, but then anything after this, and unfortunately a lot of the graduate classes are be like six o'clock and you're there until like nine o'clock at night and everybody's just dying to go home <laughs> you know, unfortunately it's the only time that works for various reasons sometimes and you just kind of ha have no choice but you can definitely tell a difference uh, as a teacher uh, between somebody who's bright and fresh and you know just the coffee's just kicked in uh, versus somebody that's had a long day and they're <laughs> Now they're in your class, <laughs> you know, it's it's 7 o'clock going on, 8 o'clock. All right, types of meetings. Uh, that's kind of nice, just two basic types, coordination meetings. It says where you're focusing on discussing roles, goals, and accountabilities, basically what it says, <laughs> coordinating, uh, versus a problem-solving meeting uh, where you something has come up, you know, there's some kind of issue there, and everybody's there brainstorming. Like, how do we deal with this problem? So I just had one of these uh, problem-solving meetings. Uh, the curriculum committee, I was there at the university curriculum committee, which is the next level of curriculum committee. Oh, my God. Uh, but they're talking, they, they got these big issues with the software curriculum navigator. It's a mess, and nobody knows they're left from the right, and there's just total chaos and confusion who should do what and when and basically they, they bring the deans in the deans are there like what can we do we got to figure out a better way to do this we, we need the curriculum process to be smoother than this this is way too hectic way too chaotic now, so they had a bunch of people there not just uh, professors not just members of the committee but uh, software vendors and uh, some kind of uh, management expert, <laughs> basically. Uh, this is, you know, this one here is really where a communication, a professional communicator can make a real difference, right? Because sometimes you want somebody there, maybe they don't know much about the actual subject or the problem itself, but they're experts at communicating. Uh, they know how to facilitate communication. They're good at running a meeting, <laughs> right? They know all this stuff. Uh, so they might be brought in as an expert to help uh, get over this uh, this problem. All right, so now we're going to get down to brass tacks uh, and the agenda. Like, what should you put on that agenda? And again, the agenda is just the plan for the meeting. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? What? Well, let's just just jump into it. So, what are the items on the agenda? What do you want to cover in that meeting? That's just what this first one means. Uh, time frames. Most agendas won't go into, won't have this, uh, but sometimes you'll see people will say, "Well, the first ten minutes we'll dedicate to this." Uh, next, we'll spend 30 minutes on this item, uh, 20 minutes on this item. Uh, goals, expected outcomes. 
Right, so you don't want to have an item on the agenda with no goal or outcome. <laughs> it's just kind of pointless. Unless you want to have that, like, why, why is this item on the agenda? And that needs to be spelled out. Uh, roles are key. And I've been in a lot of meetings where, you know, at some point in the meeting, they'll say, okay, now, uh, you know, Matt, would you, would you want to talk about this part of the, you, you, you've kind of been involved in this thing, you know, why don't you talk about that? Now, I'm like, what? <laughs> Feeling really embarrassed, kind of put on the spot. You know, that nobody told me I was going to be uh, had a, have a speaking role in this meeting. And so that needs to be that. If that was on the agenda, though, I would have seen it, would have prepared for it. It wouldn't have caught me by. Uh, I wouldn't have been caught flat-footed like that. Uh, materials needed. Uh, that kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, so we're back to Prestigio Marketing Team. Uh, meeting agenda. So you can see all the information's there. When's the meeting? How long's it last? Again, I don't think it says where the meeting will be. And this might be a place where they have just a standard meeting room. Uh, maybe that's what's going on here. But if it was on campus, you'd have to say <laughs> where, because <laughs> it could be, you know, how many buildings? Uh, I don't even know. I don't even know myself. <clears throat> so you can see the purposes of the meeting, what the outcome is supposed to be, and look at how they did their uh, agenda items here. So internet pricing for groups, and they said about 20 minutes on that. They put the roles of the various people that will be summarizing stuff and explaining it about how long they get. Because you don't want Jeff here going on for uh, 10 of the minutes <laughs> and eating into Barbara's time. You know, that's that can be really annoying. So that, that's, you know, you can see how this works. And there's probably a moderator here somewhere. I see they got a note taker. Let's see, did they say who's, they must have a chair of the committee or a leader uh, that will kind of enforce this. So Jeff, you know, you, <laughs> sorry, Jeff, I had to cut you off, Jeff. It's been uh, five minutes. We want to hear from Barbara. Uh, so you want somebody there that can kind of facilitate that. All right, running the effective meetings. Uh, create a tradition, a culture, and variety. You know, all these are key. And to some extent, you want some consistency. I mean, I wouldn't want to have a, be on a committee that you never knew when they were going to meet or where. Uh, sometimes I've been on that, but <clears throat> you do want a little bit of variety. And try to keep things interesting. You know, one thing you could say about Michael Scott... <laughs> Michael, you never know uh, what you're getting into in one of his meetings. Uh, setting expectations following the agenda. You know, this is crucial on the sometimes on the first meeting. You know, I've been I've taught classes before uh, where people get, you know, you sort of start off. You have your plan, you have your agenda, or your learning outcomes, and if you go off tangent, or you probably sat in classes like this, right, where the professor comes in and says, "Here's what we're going to talk about today." You see a slide, like the points. <laughs> you write those down, uh, but then the professor gets sidetracked and you don't actually cover anything on the agenda. Uh, so that kind of sets an expectation, and especially if that's the first couple of meetings where that happens. Uh, your expectations will be very low. <laughs> think, I don't think I'm going to get much out of this because, uh, you know, at any time, uh, one of the students is, one of my classmates is going to get the professor off on a tangent and we'll never get around uh, to the, uh, you know, the, what we're supposed to discuss. Uh, encouraging participation, expression of ideas. And if you're in the position of moderating a discussion, this can be tricky because you don't want to call people out and call on people that aren't comfortable speaking. Uh, so you kind of want to work around that. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want somebody to feel like they're not getting a chance to speak. Uh, so sometimes it's, there's nothing wrong, I think, with just saying, you know, make people raise their hands <laughs> or asking you know, does anybody else have anything they would like to uh, contribute? And then, you know, let a awkward silence. Uh, it's fine. Have that long, awkward silence and let the, because, you know, it feels awkward, uh, but it could be just somebody trying to think, okay, how do I want to say this? Let me, uh, artic how do I want to articulate this? And then they'll uh, tell you what their idea is. And, you know, not everybody's like this, snapping uh, instant response all the time. Uh, building consensus and the plan of action. Yes, yeah, closing the meeting. Uh, this can be tricky when you got some place to be, uh, but you feel bad about leaving. Uh, this is one of my pet peeves as a student, and something I never, I try never ever to do as a professor is hold a class late, uh, because you have, you might have another class right after that you need to get to, and it just feels. Uh, you know, people feel a responsibility to stick around sometimes, even when, you know, technically the class time is over. And so I say that those class times exist for a reason. 
uh, let the class go you know if you need something to talk about something after class if I have time fine but it's kind of important to close when you say you're going to close uh, dealing with difficult people that's the one that most people are curious about we'll talk more about it than this uh, coming up yeah each meeting should have a facilitator so notice this facilitator is not dictator <laughs> somebody that can keep things flowing keep people on task uh, make sure everybody gets to speak uh, that nobody's uh you know is talking over somebody else uh, making sure you get to those items on the agenda you know and you can i've been in meetings with really great facilitators and they make a huge difference you know they keep everything calm they keep everything uh, progressing uh, towards those goals i've been on other meetings though uh, when there's no I, no uh, facilitation you know and you, what happens there you got people again get off on a tangent they get off on a sidetrack it's maybe one or two people just just back and forth with them and back and forth and everybody else is just kind of there shuffling they're <laughs> looking at the clock they want to get out of there uh, nothing's getting done uh, that's a terrible place uh, so think about a good facilitation acting from this neutral position and uh, so that third person there that can say look okay you two <laughs> uh, you're saying this uh, you're saying that you know these are both good ideas but does anybody else <laughs> you know have something to say on this or, or maybe you know we spent we spent 15 minutes discussing this and we have seven other things that are really important we need to get to so I'm sorry uh, maybe we can carry that on later or on email or let's table that you know whatever you have to say uh, let's move on because we've got other items and this is good stuff too because a lot of times what happens is and this again is a good reason not to wait till the bell rings <laughs> <laughs> or the uh, actually you know the literal last minute to close the meeting because you want to have some time for reflection uh, some uh, some get some feedback right so how much information analysis and interpretation did I provide something to ask yourself uh, did, I, did I communicate my ideas even if they conflicted with someone else's so you know if you did that or not a lot of times you just don't want to hurt somebody's feelings you don't want to rock the boat now, did I participate in the implementation of the timeline? Uh, did I meet my deadlines? Did I facilitate the decision-making process, or did I just go with the flow? Uh, so, so many times disasters happen. Uh, lives are lost, literally, uh, just because somebody uh, maybe they weren't in charge, uh, they saw something was wrong, uh, but they didn't want again, didn't want to rock the boat, didn't want to say anything, and it ended up being a disaster. So you want to just be honest with yourself. Did I do that? Should I have uh, spoken up? And then if you can be honest enough to say, yes, I really should have, uh, then you want to ask yourself, well, what can I do to make sure the next time uh, I'm more prepared? Now, follow up after the meeting. So yeah, most people just distribute the minutes or the notes of the meeting. And it just all this stuff here, when did the meeting take place? Who was there? Uh, who did what you know what were the key decisions the discussion and this is not only useful for the people as kind of a reminder but especially if somebody didn't wasn't able to make it to the meeting uh, they can refer to these minutes and figure out what, what they missed and here's the example of the minutes and you can see they basically look uh, like the agenda did except that now we have the action items there and somewhere here we have yeah discussion like you discussed what I usually try to do minutes uh, when I do minutes I like to keep them up on a board somewhere or on a projector so that people can see make sure I'm accurately saying things and maybe Jeff says you know I didn't <laughs> do that <laughs> that was that was Barbara you know something like that so usually there's a step a stage at the next meeting where you say can I get an approval on the minutes and they'll say no there were some errors and they give you a chance to correct those uh, so that when the stuff goes into the permanent record you don't want mistakes because who knows you know, maybe come back and somebody could get in trouble for something that they didn't even do it was just a mistake on the minutes but it's kind of hard to prove at that time <laughs> It'd be a lot easier to fix it before the, it gets to that all right virtual teams you know obviously uh, <laughs> as you can probably tell <laughs> you're not in the classroom right now we're doing this class virtually we're having a virtual meeting uh, you could be sitting at home you could be at the library home office who knows and this is not just for school uh, countless jobs <clears throat> they're doing this and even if you have a, a job where you do have to go to an office there might be occasionally virtual things 
like we do that, that a lot at the MinSKU level or the state level. And we'll have meetings, and this might be meetings with people from different universities, maybe someone at Mankato, Bemidji, uh, you name it. Now, they're usually not, don't want to go to the expense and the hassle of bringing everybody together, so we'll just meet virtually. And it's, it's a separate set of skills that's related uh, to the face-to-face -face teams, but there's a lot of differences. And we'll see. I'm just going to focus here on what the differences are. And a lot of this, you can see, it's just, just the same stuff. Uh, as a face-to-face -face meeting, so I'm not really going to go into this. <laughs> yeah, almost exactly the same. Yeah, that was the same. Now, here's some things that might be a little bit different. Uh, starting the meeting with a social chat. So I noticed a lot of times this happens. We use a package, I think it's called Adobe. Oh, what is that product? Uh, Adobe, not Acrobat. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of this product. <laughs> it's kind of a virtual classroom. And usually what happens is kind of a, you have kind of a PowerPoint slide here, and then you have some moderators up here. Uh, and now this little box here will just be a text chat. And what a lot of the meetings will start off with, maybe for the first five or ten minutes, they'll just be saying, hi, <laughs> you know, hi, I'm so-and-so from St. Cloud. Oh, how's the weather there? You know, just real, just nothing to do with the meeting at hand. It's just kind of a little bit of socializing. And a lot of the conferences I go to will do the same thing. Uh, they usually don't jump to academic stuff right away. Uh, they'll have a little coffee, a little breakfast maybe, and people are just there, tables, talking, chatting, uh, getting to know each other. Really useful. And even in the classroom, if you're teaching or running any kind of meeting, and I've given all kinds of presentations, I always try to get there a little early, uh, even before the meeting starts, you just go around and say, hi, I'm Matt Martin. I'm the speaker for today. <laughs> you know, who are you? And really show some interest in them. You know, what brings them there? You know, do some active listening. And I find that that's not just good for them. Uh, you know, it's not just good as an icebreaker, but it works for me as well. It makes me a lot more comfortable in the room because uh, now I've gotten to know a few people, kind of uh, felt the vibe a little bit. Uh, so it's a good way to start. A meeting. Of course, it can go on for too long. Well, let's see. Start with a contentious question. Yeah, ask what do you think. So, a lot of teachers, I mean, the infamous, it's almost a stereotypical question of day one is, you know, if the course is uh, on rhetoric, you know, they'll say, uh, what is rhetoric? What What is philosophy? <laughs> it sort of seems a little contentious. You always think, well, shouldn't you know? <laughs> You're teaching the class. <laughs> Why are you asking us? <laughs> so it's a little bit contentious that way. Uh, but it could be uh, you know, something a little more provocative, you know, a statistic. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I like this one probably better. Though. The what do you think about questions? <laughs> what do you think about <laughs> D2L? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> And open up a can of worms on that one. Uh, make sure each team member is involved. Uh, articulate the views precisely. Yeah, this this does make sense because again with this virtual setting, sometimes it's easy to not pay attention to what's going on here uh, in this chat box. And uh, some some of these bigger meetings will even have a person whose job it is to moderate this or to monitor it rather. And, and kind of bring it to the speaker's attention. Hey, you know, somebody's asked a question. <laughs> Somebody pointed out something. Uh, take minutes in real time. Uh, focus on your teammates. Avoid multitasking. Oh, boy, there we go. Yeah, this is what I worry about with teaching online, is how do I know that you are this, watching this, <laughs> hanging on every word? <laughs> and how do I know you're not simultaneously playing Call of Duty or uh, on Facebook or watching a movie? Uh, you, know, you don't know that. Um, but I do find uh, when I'm in one of these virtual meetings myself, if I let myself check email, if I let myself check uh, text, I don't, I'm not so bad as to play <laughs> Call of Duty or something. <laughs> uh, but even little multitask, it can be, you can totally lose your focus and you feel like you have been abducted by aliens for a period of <laughs> 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> now suddenly you're back. You're like, who, 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 who what, who, where? <laughs> so really better to focus on them. You know, don't multitask. And I always say if, uh, you know, if people can't text and drive at the same time, which most of us have been driving for decades, and it's almost, uh, we don't even really have to think about it. You know, if you can't text, 
and drive, then how in the world do you think you can text and focus on a <laughs> virtual meeting? <laughs> We're actually learning new information. It just doesn't work. You know, I don't care how many times somebody says they're great at multitasking. Yeah, just forget about it. I focus on the job at hand. Uh, yeah, and use video when possible. So you notice I'm using videos, and one of the compliments I get on my online teaching all the time is, you know, we're so glad you're using video. You know, so many people just upload a PowerPoint. Uh, they, don't, they don't they don't say anything. There's no audio even. Uh, it's just really hard to uh, to deal with. And some sometimes they don't even provide the PowerPoints, right? They might just say it might have everything written up in in a text, you know, on discussion boards. And you know, maybe that's all they can do. It's not always possible. That's why I say when possible. You know, some people just uh, don't know how to do video. Or they're not comfortable with that format, or, or they don't think it's important, or they don't have the band. I mean, there's a million reasons why not to. But if you if it is possible, and even if you feel awkward, even if you're not a professional actor, you know, try to get over that. Uh, because people generally will prefer the video. Okay, group writing. <laughs> oh man, I've had my share of this. Uh, starting right away is key. A lot of times people won't, they want to have a lot of discussion before they get to any uh, writing. Uh, but really you're better off just, no matter how rough it is, just go ahead and get some, uh, get some text up there because as soon as you start to get text generated, uh, then you can start hashing that out, talking about it, uh, figuring out uh, where you want to go with it. Uh, maybe you just want to del uh, delete it, start over. Hey, that's fine, but at least you got some uh, start. <laughs> don't wait to don't, don't let the pressure of that deadline motivate you. Uh, work together at the planning stage. Uh, make sure your roles and contributions are fair. You know, many of us have been in this situation. Now I can't tell you how many times I've been co-writing co something, and uh, the, the other person was not writing anything. Uh, they weren't contributing anything at all until right at the last minute. You know, so that didn't really seem fair <laughs> to me. That person really should have chipped in. Uh, and you know, sometimes that's a good peer pressure, right? If you see, well, uh, this one person in the group's already written a page. I didn't write anything. You know, it's, you know maybe, maybe it's okay to feel a little bad about that. Maybe that'll give you a little bit more motivation because <laughs> uh, you really want everybody to be uh, to have a fair load, right? Uh, staying flexible, staying open, uh, meeting in real time consistently, you know, ensure the writing reflects the views of the group. And so sometimes it's just a matter of picking up the phone, having a little group chat, Skype chat. Um, yeah, ensure the writing reflects the views of the group. This can be a big one sometimes. You know, if somebody's text did get deleted, <laughs> you want to make sure you handle that carefully because yeah, you don't want to erase this person's view. Uh, how will you edit the document together? You know, I've seen people sometimes go in with a heavy hand and they edit things. Uh, they edit for style, they edit for uh, grammar, and sometimes they can actually uh, be, they can offend people with this. So they can get <laughs> introduce more mistakes, or somebody can feel like, hey, I kind of feel like you just sort of take took over. You sort of claimed ownership of my writing. You know, I did. This is my writing in this section. I don't want you in here <laughs> editing, editing it uh, by yourself, right? This is supposed to be a collaborative process. We should need to be doing this together. So, how are we going to do that? You know, we're we going to bounce an email back and forth. Or are we going to use uh, Google Docs? You know, how's it going to work? And then uh, this, this final version. How do we make sure that everybody's happy with this? You know, you don't want somebody submitting a final version without getting the approval of the group. Uh, or maybe you do. Maybe somebody says they're considered a single group member. Um, so maybe that's could be the facilitator, just somebody you feel like is uh, responsible enough to take this on. <laughs> you know, it probably wouldn't come up in a in a small group. I guess if you had five or six people, you know, this would be increasingly important to have this sort of neutral member uh, who could work to make sure that this is uh, uh, consistent. And by voice, what they're talking about is uh, you don't want usually in a document. You don't want it to sound like, well, uh, I can. This this part is written in this style, and this other section over here sounds like it's written in a completely different style. It's, that, that makes it seem uh, disorganized, confusing. Uh, it's not consistent. So it's good to have somebody that can come in and make everything basically sound like it was written by one person, even though it was in reality <laughs> written by several. Okay, finally get to the part that everybody wants to know about, right? What do you do with that difficult? conversation. We saw one in the offices. There's many, many more. 
and there's whole uh, there's whole fields <laughs> dedicated to this right conflict resolution uh, springs to mind uh, mediation uh, springs to mind uh, and a lot of times professionals just get on the other side of an argument it can be very difficult uh, to get back uh, to get them back uh, on task right or uh, sometimes a team might even fall apart so you can have difficult conversations kind of disagreements conflicts bad news right uh, you might have to tell somebody they're fired or tell you know if you're a teacher you might have to tell this group uh, well yeah this is your grade is not going to be very good on this project it could be something like that uh, it could be uh, you know something's come up and I'm not going to be able to work on this project uh, for the next two weeks <laughs> so you, you you've, you've had your share of these I'm sure yeah so most of us we don't want to have these we don't want to have these conversations we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings uh, we don't want conflict you know some people thrive on confrontation I hate it I, I really don't like uh, you know getting people riled up um, you know much less hurting somebody's feelings so nobody wants to do it I get well <laughs> some people do I guess <laughs> uh, but most people don't but what but you have to right so how, how can you do it productively all right so here's the advice for when we have to do these things <laughs> uh, one is to embrace uh, the difficult conversation so this is kind of an attitude uh, that you can have right maybe instead of uh, uh, you know maybe see this as, as a challenge <laughs> right or say you know this is you know I really want to show my professional communication chops here uh, by demonstrating that you know I can handle this right it's a challenge and that's how you can prove your expertise right so I'm imagining something like that I try to get in that mindset uh, this is important too assuming the best in others so a lot of these groups will somebody will just assume well this person's obviously lazy they don't really want to do the work uh, they don't care you know they get off on that kind of attitude and it's just going to make everything worse and really maybe you don't even know maybe you're just assuming wrongly you know what they say about assumptions <laughs> you know so you always assume the person's trying their best uh, they, they want uh, to do a good job you know they're being honest with you uh, so just assume that you know, don't don't assume they're just trying to give you a hard time uh, adopt the learning stance right so instead of telling somebody what they should think uh, or telling somebody your opinion you know back off and say you know, just let me you know let me hear your perspective let's just you know flesh it out for me uh, I'm listening you know, I'm actively listening to you I'm respecting you tell me what what it is um, staying calm overcoming the noise we talked about this last time right it's uh, so easy to uh, you know go off the rails you know, especially if it's a high stakes uh, situation uh, there could be all kinds of distractions going on all around you uh, a lot of times you might maybe you know I was thinking recently I was uh, uh, thinking about a blizzard <laughs> yeah, I heard on the news there's going to be this uh, awful blizzard and it's going to come through uh, you know St. Cloud and I was thinking about this uh, but at the same time trying to focus on what was happening at a meeting and so really I should have found a way to try to overcome this noise and say you know okay <laughs> and maybe bracket that out let me just stay calm focus on the meeting uh, finding common ground you know this this can be a really useful technique and again you could take whole classes on this uh, but yeah we so we disagree about you know you like d2l <laughs> I prefer canvas uh, but maybe just maybe there's some common ground here you know basically it sounds like we both like uh, learning management systems we both want to uh, improve the online experience and so, you know let's just start from there see if we can build anything there uh, disagreeing dip diplomatically you know this this is a uh, really key too and it makes you I think really look a lot stronger as a person it's really a good sign of professional growth if yes you really disagree with what somebody has said but you don't curse at them <laughs> you, you don't slam uh, the door uh, you know you don't burn your bridges with this person right but you just say basically yes you know we, we, we have a big disagreement of opinion on this uh, but I still respect your I still respect you <laughs> you know even if you don't respect the uh, the opinion or you know, basically just try not to uh, you know try not to burn the bridge try not to let this disagreement uh, sever the tie avoiding exaggeration and either or 
approaches. So, so you've seen this all the time. We, we talked about this. Um, uh, somebody say, well, you never turn anything in. You never turn anything, <laughs> even though you did. <laughs> and that's just exaggerating. Uh, or this, well, we only have two choices here. I mean, really, you've got lots of uh, variables you could play with. Uh, the components of the difficult conversation. Uh, starting well, declaring your intent. You know, so you are here to resolve this conflict, or you're here to hear their side of the story. So that, it's good, yeah, listen to their story. And so don't feel like you need to put words in their mouth. Don't try to, <laughs> don't feel like you already know their story. You instead, just, hey, tell me what's going on. Listen very carefully. You know, and then tell your side of it. And then see if you can create a shared story. So what? maybe you can build a, a version of this story where uh, both of you are represented, uh, both perspectives are given uh, justice. Let's see, typically you can disagree diplomatically by validating the views and feelings using I statements. Uh, validating others means you recognize the perspectives and feelings as credible or legitimate. Yeah, that's the key right there. Not necessarily mean you agree with it. Right, so basically the, it would be invalidating to tell somebody that they're stupid or that they haven't done their, any research or they, don't know, they obviously don't know anything about the topic. You know, any, any of those statements doesn't validate them. Makes it just makes you sound like a jerk. <laughs> Whereas validating would say, yes, I see where you're coming from. You know, I uh, I value your opinion. I'm glad that you feel comfortable sharing it. You know, all that sort of stuff is uh, validating. Um, I statements begin with phrases like I think, I feel, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> uh, during disagreements or difficult conversations, I statements soften comments to sound more conciliatory and flexible. Uh, so, for example, instead of saying well, the, uh, you know, that spell, <laughs> going back to D&D, &D, <laughs> that spell is a ritual. You cannot cast it, uh, you know, during combat. You know, something like this, and the person might say, well, no, no, no. So there's a big, uh, big disagreement, big uh, uh, disagreement, <laughs> non-diplomatic. <laughs> uh, whereas if you say, uh, you know, I think uh, that spell is a ritual, and I, I, I believe that you can't do the, the ritual uh, in the middle of combat, uh, you know, something like that makes it sound a little bit less like you're saying this person doesn't know what they're doing or accusing the sound like you're trying to accuse the person of cheating or something. It's a little bit more uh, conciliatory to do do it that way. Or, or I would even say maybe a, even a question, right? Are you sure that that spell can be cast in the middle of combat? You know, I, I, I think <laughs> I read that <laughs> uh, you get the idea. It's just basically not uh, being overly aggressive and uh, trying to, uh, you know, make somebody feel like uh, you think they're ignorant. All right, the chapter takeaways. I hopefully you have uh, taken some things away from this lecture. <laughs> uh, the principles of team communication, uh, the different ways you can approach a meeting to make it more effective, uh, some of the differences with the virtual team, online meetings, uh, some ways to group right, and then uh, handling a difficult conversation. So I hope that you found this useful and enjoyed it. As always, I want to hear from you. I like to hear your uh, questions, comments, thoughts, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> Please share it with me. And I uh, look forward to seeing you next time.